so over the next 10 years we'll have uh, you know, twice as many 85 year olds, we'll have old, a lot more older people, uh, we've got a lot of troubled families, our economy um, really is stagnant, um, we've, uh, we've also got problems with meeting our climate change um, uh, um, commitments. So there are a lot of challenges that Somerset faces over the next 10 to 15 years and we need to find those solutions and we need to find them now. So this is about how we join up services, how we provide better sustainable long-term services for the public and it's also about how we can release some funding to spend on things like climate change. Um, now I think as, as the world is coming out of the coronavirus it's really returning much more to business as usual I understand that there are still have to be social distance and everything but you know we, we're opening our libraries um, we're opening our registration services the shops are open the pubs are open so in actual fact now is the time that we need to be having this conversation um, I also have to link it if I can with the fact that the government are going to come out with a, a government white paper um, in the autumn and therefore this is very clearly linked to that. So that government white paper will look at local government reorganisation, it will look at local devolution and really lead the way on economic recovery. So this is all linked with that white paper and the economic recovery of Somerset. At Cabinet on Monday just gone, uh, July the 20th, your colleague Mandy Chilcott said that these proposals are not money driven. Yeah. Uh, yet we've had a couple of years where the County Council's finances have, to put it mildly, been under a severe amount of pressure. Is there any sense that the unitary proposals just amount to taking all the, the larger reserves and the commercial investments that the districts have got to prop up the, the difficult balance sheets that you've got at the moment? So I, I, I think uh, because of the decisions that were taken a couple of years ago, um, we have achieved our budgets for the last two years. In fact, you'll know that we under, underspent our budget last year and we've built our reserves uh, considerably now to £76 million. Uh, therefore, I think we are classed as a sustainable council. Uh, we don't have those financial pressures on us. But what we do as a county is have financial pressures on the public purse. So the public pound, whether it's spent by a county or a district, there are pressures on us all. Uh, and the LGA, Local Government Association and recognise that the f real financial pressures of this coronavirus pandemic are on district councils because of the loss of income, the loss of income from leisure, car parking, fees, licensing, etc. And also, we've got to remember that our district councils in Somerset have invested some £200 million in commercial property and the likes um, over the last few years, and that income really will come under pressure over the next few months. So, we believe that there, there are pressures. It's not um, particularly the, the, the county council, but it is the public purse, and therefore we do have to look at finances. But ultimately, for me, this is about how we deliver sustainable long-term services to the public, much more joined up, much more accessible, much more understandable, and much more without frictions between councils. One of the concerns that I think a lot of people have about unitary is the danger of local government being over-centralised and distant and unaccountable. Absolutely. Um, and Somerset is a very um, varied and diverse county. I mean, what happens in somewhere like Porlock or Dunster isn't really relevant to the people of, say, Froome or Bruton. No. So what do you have in your proposals that are going to counteract both the public expectations and the actual technical dangers of being over-centralised? So the government expect us to build in how we uh, uh, operate at a very local level. Even, even as a strategic unitary authority, you do need to operate at a very local level. And we'll do that through a number of ways. One is the local community networks, which are clearly set out in our business case. Excuse me. <coughs> clearly set out in our business case uh, and they really take decision making to a community level and we're aiming there'll be 15 to 20 of those across the county so Porlock will be handled in a very different way to Froome, will be handled in a very different way to Encanton because they have different priorities. The local community networks really are important for that. The second way is that we see our towns and parishes as really important and don't forget the city of Wales, sorry, I mustn't forget the city of Wales. So we see our towns and our parishes as really important about they know what their community's priorities are. We need to work with them. We need to work with them in terms of devolving assets, in terms of de devolving services if they want it, uh, and making sure there's a safety net for everybody else. But it can't be a cost shunt. We have to work with our towns and parishes to make it much more local. And then I think the last thing to say is, of course, we will always need hubs around the county where people can go to and where they can access services. So instead of it being centralised, in fact, it's going to be far more decentralised than we've currently got. 
We are sitting, like I said, in the quad at County Hall. Um, you're in the process of completing a £10 million upgrade to A Block just over to your right. Um, but I think from what you've described with the local community networks, um, there's a sense that this building will be used less as a result. So, so how does that tie in to, your, to the One Somerset plans? I mean, are we in a situation where you'll have spent £10 million on a building that in two years' time will hardly be used? So, uh, the first thing to say is that we had to spend money on County Hall. It was nearly uh, 40 years since any money had been spent on it, and the heating system, which also drove the court, uh, heat the courts uh, behind us, there uh, uh, was failing. So we had to spend money on it. Um, about a third of our staff are based out of County Hall here in Taunton. Um, current staff, a third of our current staff. The rest are based out across the county. So in actual fact, as a county council, um, we have more staff in, in Mendip, more staff in, than Mendip do, we have more staff in South Somerset than South Somerset do, in Somerset Western Taunton than they do, and in distant Sedgeport. So we have staff decentralised all across the county. That will not change. Those services still need to be provided, whether they're districts currently or county services in the future. So there will always need to be a, 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 an office where the, uh, the backroom functions are provided, um, but in actual fact, uh, in the model, they'll be very decentralised and we will maintain those hubs in the various parts of the county. Both Somerset Western Taunton and South Somerset have embarked on transformation mm. projects. I mean, there's a lot in your business case about the amount of money that can be saved through yep. cutting duplication. Um, but both of their transformations have run into difficulty with the both the bill for extra temporary staff and the higher than expected level of redundancy. Yep. So what are you going to do to ensure that firstly those savings predictions are met and also that you don't have a huge brain drain or exodus as soon as unitary comes about because staff don't feel that they're being made welcome anymore? Okay, so the first thing to explain is that there are two types of savings. One is transition savings, which is the one that are in our business case, which is the 18.5 million. They are available to us on uh, year one, year two, year three, every year after 18.5 million. The transformation savings, which is when you bring departments together and transform your services, are not in the business case because the government don't expect them to be in there. In fact, don't want them to be in there because they'll be delivered by a unitary authority. So our savings that we're talking about are transition on day one as we bring together those organisations. So the duplication of roles is very specific. So we will not have duplication of roles of carers, we won't have duplication of roles of environmental health officers or certain other roles. Um, where we'll have duplication is in chief executives, directors, councillors, in fact leaders of the council as well. There'll be five of those and actually we'll only need one in future. So. So the duplication is at a certain level um, where jobs are not duplicated and there'll be no impact. What's really interesting as well is that actually we've got a lot of applications to join us at the moment because people actually want to come and work in Somerset and I think we've got some really good news stories and it's attracting some good people uh, and I don't see the brain drain at all, I don't see that as an issue. I think people see it as a career opportunity where we can bring together small departments and make them much more effective and give people career opportunities. And just finally, on the time scale for this, um, you've set out that if all goes well and the government accepts your business case, that yep. the new unitary could be in place by 2022. Yep. Now, we've obviously got the county council elections next yep. May, yep. and I think a lot of people will be listening to this and thinking, well, isn't it a bit silly to have an election and then another one for a new authority? Yep. Um, so are you going to be putting in any requests to either delay or cancel next year's elections so that you can get the new unitary in place? So the first thing to say that my brief to my candidates for next year's elections and other party candidates is assume you're fighting an election on May the 6th because we all have to assume that that's going to happen. Somebody way above my pay grade will decide whether it's not going to happen. Um, and there is an argument, and I've heard the argument being put, and I've heard the argument being discussed at quite a high level, that actually to have two elections would be a complete nonsense. So there is an option, I believe, that one would be um, delayed and then moved back to 2022. Where we're at at the moment is that election will take place until somebody else decides that it won't, um, and then we'll all, we'll all change our plans. David Fodergill, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.